I became associated with Smalls Jazz Club back in 1996 when the club was opened by a man named Mitch Borden, who uh, ran it as a very free and open-ended space for young jazz musicians to perform and to hang out late and to play with very little supervision. After September 11, 2001, he went bankrupt because of the changes that took place in New York City and the club was actually closed. I had worked for him all those years, nine years, and then uh, what happened was this space, 183 West 10th Street, was taken by another person to try to open it as a, a different kind of bar, and they uh, managed to actually get a liquor license for the space and, bring, and upgrade it to a uh, standard level, but when they opened, they couldn't get any business because everybody wanted Small's Jazz Club. So this guy contacted Mitch and asked him to reopen Small's with him as the owner. That went on for a few years. Mitch came to me right after they opened again and asked if I could supply a piano for the club, and I said I would in exchange for a regular show once a week, and that became my steady gig every Sunday at Small's Jazz Club. When I first started playing at Small's in 1996, Mitch didn't have any headliners in that time. He just basically took his space and said, anybody that wants to play here can play here, and he didn't have a liquor license, so he basically operated 24 hours a day. Since there was no bar, people just came and go. In fact, people lived here. It was a, it was a mess. It wouldn't be allowed nowadays, but in those days, we're talking about in the late 90s, New York was a lot different in terms of how they would operate a business like that. Now it would be unallowable. But however, because of that environment, it kind of germinated a generation of young musicians who now, in this time, are all some of the more prominent names of the field. You know, if you're talking about Josh Redman or Brad Meldow or Peter Bernstein, you know, they've all kind of come through Smalls Jazz Club. There's a whole host of musicians that have come up. And the hallmark of Smalls and its day was what we call jam sessions. In uh, March of 2020, we were shut down by the COVID pandemic and uh, we were faced with a, what turned out to be 15 months of not being able to operate, but still being uh, responsible for rent and expenses. And it was thanks to people worldwide who loved our club uh, sending us donations that we were actually able to uh, get through that period and now we're thankfully reopened again to crowds at Smalls Jazz Club in Mesro. The very first person to give a donation to the Smalls Live Foundation was rock star Billy Joel. And this was uh, around May, right after we'd been closed a month, and I was uh, despairing with my wife and we were wondering what would happen to us when uh, a friend of mine called me up and said, I, I think Billy Joel's going to give you guys some money and I couldn't believe it because I didn't know Billy Joel at all personally, of course everyone knows who he is, but uh, you know, uh, it turns out that he's very concerned about music and musicians, and he's kind of a musician's musician himself, so he wanted to make that gesture. So that started the ball rolling for us for fundraising for the Smalls Life Foundation, and that's what kept us afloat. So right now, all we're really trying to do is just get our business operating efficiently so people have a great time, when musicians are performing, everyone's staying happy. It sure feels good to be back in business again at Smalls Jazz Club. The thing about jazz music particularly, which is uh, people really don't understand it at all in terms of the, uh, the, uh, you know, the mystical level of its importance, because it's really much, much akin to, say, a Zen art. In fact, it is Zen, but most guys don't know what that is anyway. So you're just pursuing this uh, immediate concentration, this reaction, and it puts you in a place that's not about you, it's not about anything. There's something operating through you, and it's very pure. I never approached music from a career standpoint. I always kind of thought of it, and actually was forced to think of it as a, more of an artistic approach to life, almost uh, akin to, say, uh, entering into a monastic order or some kind of religious lifestyle, rather than trying to be famous or make a career. You know, jazz is a funny thing because the musicians always looked great, all of them. It was a real tradition of jazz to always look sharp as a tack and cross the board. And I'm talking, if you look at pictures from jazz musicians from the 1920s, the 1930s, the 1940s, the 1950s, they're, they're all sharp. Then something happened where it became okay to not look good on stage anymore. And the tradition, I think, was hurt by that because in the original Music, you know, like for example, if you look at J.S. Bach or those guys, 
they always wore a black robe, you know. Concert musicians always wore tuxedos. And Miles Davis and his great quartets or quintets and John Coltrane even as far out as they went, they always wore tuxedos to their gigs, you know. I had the fortune of working in a hotel for many years on the staff where you're expected to put on your tuxedo every single night. So it's something about the formality of dress and the style. Now, I don't think I have a personal, uh, a, you know, sophisticated taste in terms of suits or uh, clothing of that nature, but I do respect the power that it imbues on the wearer. And you know, most notably Miles Davis or somebody like that. I know Wynton Marsalis, for example, comes down here and he's always dressed super sharp, or Jeremy Pelt for that matter. My name is Jeremy Pelt and I play the trumpet. In the jazz scene, the, the style icons I would have looked up to would have uh, obviously been Miles Davis. I think he was it, but also looking at old pictures of Duke Ellington, um, and, and the jackets that he's wearing. You know, I was always, I started to become more conscious of how the suits were cut and accessorized or not accessorized. And that really, in turn, you know, gave me more of a concept of how I should look. If I rounded it off, I would say maybe about 15 years ago, starting to, to really go places and, and have things tailored to me. I do feel different on stage when, when I'm wearing custom suiting. Again, it, it, it alludes to the exclusivity of it all. I, I think there's something that is, that, that is very, uh, kind of like, it makes you feel like you're part of this, this, this singular secret of society of, of you're the only one that's got this. And there's always somebody that's like, man, where you get that suit made? And you have no problem telling where you got it made, but you don't, you know, you know that this is just for you, you know. So I mean, it does it does affect you in that sort of way, and you try not to, uh, you know, make it uh, <laughs> go to your head. <laughs> I do feel like the selection of, of different components of a suit, and and, and and especially in custom designs, is akin to to the uh, improvisational aspect of the music. Both of them involve uh, choices, quite obviously. You want to be able to make not so much the right choices, sometimes the right choices kind of come through as the safe choices. It's about really creating something that's unique to yourself, and I think that's, uh, that's the similarities. Well, uh, in my case, I don't really spend too much time thinking about what I dress in. However, I do believe very strongly in the idea of tradition and I like very much the fact that musicians, like I said, used to have a sense of formality when it was time to perform. Even if it was in a lobby of a hotel or something, you would put on a dark suit or a tuxedo or something to that effect. So I like the idea of musicians showing up on the bandstand wearing, you know, attractive looking but maybe dark colored suits so that they're not distracting. Jazz music is almost like, like I said, it's very like classical in the sense that the performer is really not the point, it's the music and the transcendence of the performance. So you want as little distraction as possible. You don't want eyesores either, you know, so I think that's the importance of the, uh, the suit in that context. I think I certainly have an anachronistic viewpoint of, of society and music even, perhaps. I mean, I consider myself to be a forward-thinking musician, but, you know, tradition is not to be discarded. Tradition is to be understood and then expressed in your own way, and that's how you validate art over the generations. So to discard tradition is really something foolish, um, but everyone, a lot of artists make that mistake because they think they're being innovative. There's really no need to uh, aspire to innovation if you're an original person because then you're automatically innovating. Uh, in jazz, there was always uh, a great attention to looking good on stage so as to complement your audience. I remember some older musicians at Smalls back when we were kids and guys would get up on the bandstand wearing sweatpants or hoodies or something and he would be like, what, what are you guys doing? Why are you dressed like you just came out of your garage when you're in front of a, you know, 80 people in a jazz club? You know, what, get it together. Because in the old days it would never fly. You, would, you wouldn't even be allowed in the club unless you were wearing a jacket or a tie or a suit. You know, that was just normal. So I think the standards of society have changed from the aesthetic of, say, the 1950s and 60s, 40s, say. In my heart, I think I'm much more akin to the, like, the late 40s, 1950s in terms of what would be a stylistic ideal. And I like those kind of cuts of that time period. You know, I like that kind of 
classic look on a suit. You know, even if it seems a little dated to people, that's kind of always in my mind what looks great. That's why I love looking at those old photographs from that time. The next time I have a big concert, I'm going to put on my J Press suit and look killing out there. I, I, I plan on that. Well, I'm a Buddhist in heart. That's my real religious spirit. I was born uh, Jewish here in New York City, but embraced Buddhism early on. And so uh, it's, it's really helped me guide my life as well. And uh, one of the things they talk about in, in Buddhism is the idea of one candle lighting another, lighting another. You know, like the flame itself being eternal as it's passed from candle to candle, that kind of thing. And, and jazz is the same way because it's uh, in New York City especially, it's an oral tradition that for the most part has not been broken at all since the time of, say, Scott Joplin in the turn of the century. Because really, if you think about it, you had Fats Waller and those guys, and then it went on to Teddy Wilson's generation and Bud Powell, and then to the 1960s piano players and Cedar Walton and Harold Mayburn, and that came right up to us. Like, you know, we studied with the guys that studied with the guys that studied. So there has been this candle lighting that's been going on. COVID was the first time in history that all the gigs in New York City stopped, probably for 300 years. I don't know if there's ever been a time in history when New York City was stopped, and that's what happened. Now, we had these embers of the fire down here in our little hearth, and we were trying to, you know, keep the shit burning a little bit, you know, and, and of course, you know, as uh, you can add fuel to the fire, then it will become a conflagration again. My hope is that young musicians will be able to embrace the tradition of what has been and learn its lessons deeply and then filter it through their own individual spirit and pass it on to the future. And uh, we at Smalls Jazz Club really believe in world peace through music because it's a universal language. Oh, see that? That's for everyone to know, you know, there's no language barrier when it comes to music. The people that like it can hear it, and the people that don't like it, you know, you've got to say, hmm. you know, like, who are the people that don't like music? Those are the ones we have to be aware of, you know. Uh, we aspire for world peace through jazz music, worldwide unification, How about that. My name is Spike Wilner. I'm a jazz pianist, and I'm also the uh, owner and operator of Smalls Jazz Club and Mesro Jazz Club here in Greenwich Village, New York City.